God, open us up this morning. Open our eyes that we might see. Open our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts, God, that we might feel. Open our hands that we might serve. And God, open the doors of this church that all might come. Amen. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I know that those are words to a Christmas song, but I've been humming them this past week for a different reason. College football is back. An amen from the front row. I hope that your alma mater did well yesterday. Um, But I was sitting there watching uh, the football on TV, and I was thinking about how ironic it was to have these words of James about the dangers of favoritism going through my mind while it seems like everybody everywhere is reminding others who their favorite team is, right? Shirts and jerseys. There's a Georgia shirt right there. Shirts and jerseys are coming out of the dresser. Flags are reappearing on front porches. On my street alone, just about 30 houses, there are 11 different college flags waving. (laughs) And neighbors that have treated each other so well all summer (laughs) are are glaring at each other from their driveways now. And, and it's amazing, isn't it, how something like college football that can bring so much joy and can bring so many people together can also create so much conflict and cause so much division. If the divisions aren't obvious to you everywhere outside the stadium, I encourage you to go inside one this fall because you will be shocked at what you see. Grown adults with jobs and mortgages and kids that they are responsible for raising will paint their chests (laughs) and will scream to hell with this school or that school and will bark in the face of complete strangers. And these are just the sober ones. It gets much worse, doesn't it? Now, this is a lot of fun if you're, if you're with the home team, isn't it? And you're sitting in the alumni section and you're surrounded by hundreds and thousands of people that are dressed in the same colors you're dressed in. But it's a little different when, we're, when you're with the visitor team. Anybody ever traveled with their team before? Some of you know uh, that I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia which is why I have such a high intellect and capacity for joy. <laughs> and I remember my first trip to Knoxville to see the dogs play the University of Tennessee in their house. And some friends and I had tickets in the visitor's section of Neyland Stadium. Anyone ever been the visitor's section of Neyland Stadium? It is a horrible place. (laughs) You have to climb like 20 flights of stairs that I don't think have been mopped since the Herschel Walker days. Your feet stick to the ground. There don't seem to be any concession stands. All the bathrooms are strangely out of order. And I swear that they have built the stadium in such a way that the, the visitor section and only the visitor section looks directly into the sun at kickoff. And you can't see anything which is actually kind of a blessing because otherwise you have to look at this hideous orange and white checkered field. So it's kind of nice, actually. (laughs) This weird thing happens, too. Right at the beginning of the game, uh, the PA announcer comes on the loudspeaker and he says, Welcome to Neyland Stadium. Welcome. And I'm sitting up there in a puddle of my own sweat, like a mile above the field, glaring at the sun and I'm thinking I, I, I don't feel so welcome here I don't really feel very welcome in this place James the writer of the letter that we have been working through James is kind of painting a picture like that to warn us about favoritism he's saying that within the church We can sometimes create an environment where we may say with our words, you are welcome here. But our actions may sometimes communicate something entirely different. Our actions may actually tell people that some are more welcome than others. That some people have more welcome in this place than other people might. 
And James is saying, when you, when you honor one person and ignore another, when you, when you bring some people down to what amounts to be the best seats and you point others to the cheap seats in the back, you're making evil judgments. James says that when we begin to make decisions about how inclusive or exclusive we are going to be for certain individuals based on how they might think or how they might believe or how they might vote or dress or live their life or worship, when we begin to make those kind of decisions, James says we are committing sin. Now you may be wondering, is it, is it really that bad of a sin? I mean, to welcome some people to treat some people just a little bit better than others? I mean, is it that bad of a thing to, to bring in maybe, say, the people that pay for most of the church's bills? Or to bring the people that might have good influence in the community? Or the people that might make this place a little bit more of a comfortable and attractive group? Is, is it that bad to, to let them know how special they are, how much we appreciate them a little bit more than, than those that aren't in those categories? Because that's kind of how we've, we've been conditioned to think in most places, right? If you, if you pay a little extra for your ticket on Delta, where do they let you sit? In first class, where the seats are just a little bit cushier, and the movie screen is just a little bit bigger, and the food is just a little bit better than what the folks behind you get. And, and just to make sure that everyone knows who's who, what have they installed? A curtain. And when that curtain slides shut, you know where you stand, don't you? Would you believe that years and years ago there were walls and curtains to section off certain parts of the temple in Jerusalem from other parts of the temple? And so if you were poor, you had to stay in what was called the outer courtyard to worship God. And that was where people left their animals and there was no roof to protect you from the sun or the rain. If you could afford just a small sacrifice, though, if you could maybe buy a, a, a turtle dove, you got to come into the inner courtyard. And there was still no roof over your head, but it smelled slightly better. And you could actually get a good view of the sanctuary. But if you were really wealthy... If you could provide the priests with bulls and goats for the offering, you got to actually go inside the sanctuary where the burnt offerings were made. But even in there, there was one place that only the high priest could go. It was called the Holy of Holies. It was where they kept the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Ark that they believed was where God's glory dwelt. And guess what they had installed in the Holy of Holies, a curtain. And so when the priest would go behind the curtain and he would close it, everybody knew exactly where they stood. And that was how they kept religious order. If you were of a certain class, if you had a certain degree of influence, if you had a certain level of education, if you wore a certain type of clothing, you got to get just a little bit closer to God than everybody else did. But then this rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus comes along. And he starts doing some unusual things. He starts honoring the folks that were used to being dishonored all the time. And Jesus starts reaching out to the people that nobody else even wanted to touch. He starts loving the least and the last in the community. And people would come around and they would say, Jesus, why are you doing this? Why are you treating people this way? And, and Jesus said, that's the way it is in God's house. In God's house, you're not judged by how many people may come and serve you. You're judged by how many people you go and serve. In God's house, when you offer hospitality to people that have nothing to offer you in return, you're helping to usher in God's kingdom. In God's house, when you welcome the children, when you welcome the poor, when you welcome the outcast, you're really welcoming 
God into your midst. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that, that this message kind of ruffled the feathers of the political and the religious leaders because Jesus was messing with their system. Jesus was messing with the hierarchy that they had in place to keep the right people here and the wrong people over there. And so they hung him on a cross and they crucified him. But an amazing thing happened while Jesus was on the cross. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, the scripture says that the foundation of the temple shook and the curtain that had been put up to keep God away from everybody was torn in two. Which was God's way, I think, of saying that everything Jesus had been talking about was for real. That, that the way that Jesus was treating people was the way that we all should treat one another. It was God's way of saying, look, I am not only available to a select few, I am out. My presence and my spirit is for everyone. And then this movement called Christianity was launched after this. This movement that was based on an idea that all all ought to be equally welcome because all are equally God's sons and daughters. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, rich or poor, gay or straight, black or white, member or guest, it doesn't matter. Everyone, everyone is someone for whom Christ died. Everyone that you meet is someone for whom Christ died. Bishop Bev Jones once put it like this. He said, there's no one on, no one on earth that God loves any more than you and no one that God loves any less. In God's house, there are no favorites. And so imagine how James, Jesus' brother, must have felt to discover just a few years after Christ's death and resurrection to discover that the church was playing favorites with people. Imagine how frustrated James must have been to discover this place that was meant to be a source for all joy, a place to bring all people together was being turned into a place that was creating conflict. And it was causing such divisions. Do you think maybe, maybe James was trying to remind, remind everyone that the curtain had been torn in two? Yeah. Do you think that James may have been trying to tell the church that in God's house there are no favorites? Yeah. Do you think that James might be trying to say to us that in the kingdom of heaven there is no visitors section and alumni section, that Georgia fans and Tennessee fans all sit together in the shade and are all filled with joy and peace and treat each other with love and mercy no matter what? No, that's, that's a trick question. There are no Tennessee fans in the kingdom of heaven. Come on. <laughs> But, but if there were, if there were, I think maybe that's what James, the picture that James would be trying to paint. When you're at Neyland Stadium, when you're in Tennessee's house, Tennessee gets to make the rules about who sits where. When you're in Delta's house on the airplane, Delta gets to make the rules about who sits where. But the great mistake that we so often make is we think that this is our house, don't we? We think that this house belongs to Dunwoody United Methodist Church. But friends, it doesn't. This is not ours. This is God's house. This is God's table. This is God's meal. And all of us here are God's guests. And there are no VIPs. There's no favorites. 
And there's only one rule in God's house. It's that you love. It's that you love your neighbor the way that God loves your neighbor. It's that you love the person to your left and to your right and in front of you and behind you and that you love whoever may come through that door, whoever it may be, however they may appear, whatever you think they may have to offer this place, the only rule in this house is that you love. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful. We have so much gratitude and thanksgiving that we offer for being invited into your kingdom, into your family, to be called sons and daughters. We remember Christ's words who said that he was going to his father's house to prepare a place for us. But sometimes, God, we forget that it's God's house that we live in. We think that, that these buildings and, and these services belong to us. And that that gives us a right to decide who can come and who cannot. To decide who gets to have the good seats and who has to sit in the back. Lord, you have said that when we act this way, when we welcome some and not others, that we are committing sin. God, we repent and we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you would teach us, God, how to be as merciful as with others as you are with us, that you would teach us how to be forgiving, how to be loving, how to be open, especially to those who we think don't belong. Lord, as we come to this table to receive the gift of your meal, of the body and blood of your Son, may it nourish us May it work in us so that the grace and the love that we receive here could be shared through us with the whole world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.